This holiday season at Pet Boys, buy three, get the fourth free instantly on select tires. Make an appointment at PetBoys.com. Offer valid through November 30th. Requires installation and additional fees. See store for details or visit PetBoys.com to learn more. This is Space Time Series 20, Episode 84, for broadcast on the 27th of October, 2017. Coming up on Space Time. Why filling the early universe with knots could explain why it's three-dimensional. Titan's noxious ice clouds. And another space station planned for the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Have you ever wondered why your earbud, wires, the garden hose, even knitting yarn and ropes always tend to get knotted and jumbled up? Well, a team of scientists have, and they've come up with the idea that this is a basic characteristic of the cosmos, and one which may just explain why we live in a universe with three spatial dimensions. In fact, they even think it may explain how the universe was formed in the first place. This team of physicists think that shortly after it popped into existence 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was filled with knots formed from flexible strands of energy caught flux tubes that linked elementary particles together. Their idea, reported in the European Physical Journal C and on the pre-pressed physics website archive.org, provides a kind of neat explanation for why we inhabit a universe with three spatial dimensions. The question of why our universe has exactly three large spatial dimensions, in addition to the temporal dimension of time, is one of the most profound puzzles in cosmology. But in actuality, it's only occasionally addressed in the scientific literature. For a new solution to this puzzle, the authors took a common element from the standard model of particle physics and mixed it with a little basic knot theory. The child produced by this unholy union is a novel scenario that not only explains the predominance of three spatial dimensions, but also provides a natural power source for the cosmic inflationary growth spurt the universe went through in the microseconds after its existence. The common element that the physicists have borrowed is known as a flux tube. It's comprised of quarks, those elementary particles that make up protons and neutrons, held together by another type of elementary particle called a gluon, which carries the strong nuclear force that glues the quarks together. Gluons link positive quarks to matching negative antiquarks using flexible tubes of energy called flux tubes. As the linked particles get pulled apart, the flux tubes get longer until they reach a point where they break. When this happens, it releases enough energy to form a second quark-antiquark pair that splits up and binds with the original particles, in the process producing two pairs of bound particles. The authors say you should think of the process as if a bar magnet was being cut in half to get two smaller bar magnets, each with its own north and south poles. The physicists became intrigued with the possibility that flux tubes could have played a key role in the initial formation of the universe. Now, According to currently accepted theories, when the universe was created, it was initially filled with a superheated primordial soup known as a quark-gluon plasma. The authors realised that a higher energy version of the quark-gluon plasma would have been an ideal environment for flux tube formation in the early universe. You see the large numbers of pairs of quarks and antiquarks being spontaneously created and annihilated would have generated myriads of flux tubes. Now, normally the flux tube that links a quark and antiquark disappears when the two particles come into contact and self-annihilate. But there are exceptions. For example, if the tube takes the form of a knot, then it can become stable and can even outlive the particles that created it. And if one of the particles traces the path of an overhand knot, for instance, then its flux tube will form a trefold knot. As a result, the knotted tube will continue to exist, even after the particles that it links annihilate each other. Stable flux tubes are also created when two or more flux tubes become interlinked. The simplest example is the Hoff link, which consists of two interlinked circles. In this fashion, the entire universe could have been filled up with a tight network of flux tubes. And when the authors calculated just how much energy such a network could contain, they discovered it was enough to power an entire period of early cosmic inflation. Cosmic inflation is important because it explains why the universe appears to be homogeneous on the larger scales, something which wouldn't have happened after 13.8 billion years if things were simply allowed to evolve on their own. 
Since the idea of cosmic inflation was introduced in the early 1980s, cosmologists have generally accepted the proposition that the early universe must have gone through some sort of a period of rapid expansion when it increased in size from roughly that of a proton to about the size of a grapefruit in less than a trillionth of a second. This period of hyperexpansion solves two important problems in cosmology. It can explain observations that space is both flatter and smoother than astrophysicists think it should be. But despite these advantages, acceptance of the theory has always been hindered because an appropriate energy source has never been identified. Not only do flux tube networks provide the energy needed to drive this inflation, they also explain why it suddenly stopped. As the universe began expanding, the flux tube network began to decay, eventually breaking apart, and therefore eliminating the very energy source that was powering the expansion. When the network broke down, it filled the universe with a gas of subatomic particles and radiation, thereby allowing the evolution of the universe to continue evolving into what we see today. The idea provides a natural explanation for a universe with three spatial dimensions. Of course, there are a number of higher dimensional theories, such as string theory, that visualize the universe as having nine or more spatial dimensions. Generally, their proponents explain that these high dimensions are all hidden from view in one fashion or another. But the flux tube theory's explanation comes from basic knot theory, which claims that knots only form in three dimensions. A two-dimensional example might help explain. Say you put a dot in the centre of a circle on a sheet of paper. There is simply no way to free the circle from the dot while staying on the sheet. However, if you add a third dimension, you can then lift the circle above the dot and move it to one side, until the dot is no longer inside the circle before lowering the circle back down again. Something similar happens to three-dimensional knots if you add a fourth spatial dimension. Under those circumstances, the mathematics shows they'll unravel. For this reason, knotted or linked tubes can't form in high-dimensional spaces. The next step for the authors will involve developing the hypothesis until it can make some predictions about the nature of the universe, which can actually be tested. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists have discovered a toxic band of high-altitude ice clouds above the south pole of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. The noxious stratospheric cloud cover was detected floating about 160 to 210 kilometres above the surface, far higher than the methane rain clouds in Titan's troposphere. The newly discovered cloud band covered a huge area near the south pole, from around 75 to 85 degrees south latitude. Although invisible in ordinary light, the clouds were picked up in infrared wavelengths by Cassini's composite infrared spectrometer prior to last month's mission end. The discovery adds the complex chemistry of organic molecules already detected in Titan's atmosphere. Scientists used laboratory experiments to match the cloud's chemical signatures. They found the exotic ice in the cloud is a combination of the simple organic molecule hydrogen cyanide together with the large ring-shaped chemical benzene. The two chemicals appear to have condensed at the same time to form ice particles rather than one being laid on top of the other. One of the study's authors, Kerry Anderson from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says the newly discovered clouds represent a new chemical formula of ice in Titan's atmosphere. She says what's interesting is that this noxious ice is made up of two molecules that condense together out of the rich chemical mixture of the South Pole. In Titan's stratosphere, a global circulation pattern sends a current of warm gases from the hemisphere where it's summer to the winter pole. And the circulation reverses direction when the seasons change, leading to a buildup of clouds at whichever pole is experiencing winter. Shortly after its arrival at Saturn in 2004, Cassini found evidence for this phenomenon at Titan's North Pole. Later, near the end of the spacecraft's 13-year study of the Saturnian system, a similar cloud buildup was detected at the South Pole. Different types of gases tend to condense into ice clouds at different altitudes, depending on how much vapour is present and on the temperatures which become colder and colder at lower altitudes in the stratosphere. However, the reality is somewhat more complicated, because each type of cloud forms over a range of altitudes, so it's possible for some ices to condense simultaneously. Anderson and colleagues sorted through the complex set of infrared fingerprints from the many molecules in Titan's atmosphere. The spectrometer separates infrared light into its component colours, sort of like raindrops creating a rainbow. It then measures the strengths of the signal at different wavelengths. 
And the new high-altitude South Polar Cloud has a distinctive and very strong chemical signature that showed up in three sets of Titan observations taken from July through to November 2015. Because each of Titan's seasons lasts some seven Earth years, it was late fall or autumn at the South Pole the whole time. The spectral signatures of the ices observed didn't match those of any individual chemicals, so the authors undertook laboratory experiments to simultaneously condense different mixtures of gas. Using an ice chamber that simulates conditions in Titan's stratosphere, the authors tested pairs of chemicals that had infrared fingerprints at the right part of the spectrum. At first, they let one gas condense before the other, but they found the best results were achieved by introducing both hydrogen cyanide and benzene into the chamber at the same time and then allowing them to condense together. By itself, benzene doesn't have a distinctive far infrared fingerprint. But when it was allowed to co-condense with hydrogen cyanide, the far infrared fingerprint of the co-condensed ice was a close match for the Titan clouds. Additional studies will try to determine the structure of the co-condensed ice particles. Anderson and colleagues expect them to be lumpy and disorderly rather than well-defined crystals. The authors previously found similar samples of co-condensed ice near Titan's North Pole in 2005, about two years after the winter solstice in Titan's northern hemisphere. However, that cloud formed at a much lower altitude under 150 kilometres. And it also had a different chemical composition with hydrogen cyanide and cyanoacetylene, one of the more complex organic molecules found in Titan's atmosphere. Anderson attributes the differences in the two clouds to seasonal variations at the North and South Poles. You see, the Northern Cloud was detected about two years after the Northern Winter Solstice, but the Southern Cloud was seen about two years before the Southern Winter Solstice. So it's possible that the mixtures of gases were slightly different between the two cases, or that temperatures had warmed up a bit by the time the Northern Polar Cloud was spotted. Or maybe it's both. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new scientific paper looking at the discovery of Britain's Beagle 2 Mars lander has been published in the Open Science Journal of the Royal Society. The findings detail efforts to locate the 32kg probe, which disappeared after being deployed from the European Space Agency's Mars Express orbiter on December 19, 2003. The Beagle 2 is named after the HMS Beagle, the ship used by Charles Darwin during his famous voyage of discovery. The lander was expected to touch down on the Acidus Planetia on Christmas Day, heralding its safe arrival by playing a pre-programmed song specially written and performed by the British rock group Blur. The Acidus Planetia is an enormous flat sedimentary basin overlying the boundary between the ancient Martian highlands and its vast northern plain lowlands. Once on the ground, the Beagle 2 would have unfurled its petal-like solar panels and commenced its primary mission of looking for signs of life, past or present, on the red planet's surface. However, instead of the dulcet tones of blur followed by vast amounts of scientific data, a $40 million probe went silent when it reached the red planet's surface. And despite many attempts to re-establish contact, the Beagle 2 has remained silent. For over a decade, its ultimate fate remained a mystery. Speculation as to the cause of the mission's failure was rampant, with the mission's creator and principal investigator, Professor Colin Pillinger, claiming blurred images from NASA's Mars Global Surveyor Orbiter suggested the Beagle 2 had come down in a crater. Pillinger speculated that higher-than-expected dust levels in the Martian atmosphere may have captured enough heat to expand the air sufficiently to reduce its density, but just enough to prevent the spacecraft's parachutes from slowing the probe sufficiently. This then resulted in the Beagle 2 hitting the ground far too hard, destroying the spacecraft. However, later high-resolution images by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft showed that the crater in question was in fact empty, at least empty of the Beagle 2. A formal British governmental commission of inquiry into the failure came up with four possible scenarios, all of which are based on nothing more than pure speculation. It could have been that the Martian atmosphere wasn't as expected, and the Beagle 2 simply bounced off into deep space during its descent. On the other hand, the probe's parachute or cushioning airbags may have failed to deploy correctly, resulting in the probe crashing onto the surface. Then again, the probe's protective back shell may have become tangled in the parachute during the descent, preventing the chute from working properly. Or maybe the Beagle 2 became wrapped up in its airbags or parachute on the surface, preventing the lander from opening. Or the parachute deployment sequence being wrongly triggered by a faulty accelerometer. 
However, the truth was finally revealed in January 2015 when the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter finally imaged the two-metre-wide lander, sitting quite intact and perfectly stable on the red planet's surface and well within its landing zone, in fact just five kilometres off a perfect bullseye. Now, the imaging analysis appears to show the probe on the surface and at least partially deployed. Nearby are objects interpreted as being the parachute and the back cover. It now seems the Beagle 2 landed safely just as planned. It looks like the problem may have been that two of the lander's four petal-like solar panels failed to fully open, and that prevented deployment of its radio antenna, blocking communications. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Now, this search has been going on for a while. Fred, we have discussed Beagle 2 once before, I believe. We certainly have, yeah. So Beagle 2, the mystery lander. In fact, the the details of this were released a little while ago, I think about a year and a half ago. But we've just had more information. That's why the story's resurfaced. So the main story goes back to 2003, when a spacecraft called Mars Express was sent by the European Space Agency agency to orbit the planet Mars. And that Mars Express is still functioning. It's still doing a great job of uh, surveying Mars. On Earth, however, before that project took off, there was a Mars enthusiast, a British scientist by the name of Professor Colin Pillinger, worked at the Open University, and a Mars enthusiast, and very keen to send a lander to Mars, which would be equipped with the right sort of detectors to look for metabolic processes. In other words, he was interested in finding whether there was any signs of life on the red planet. And so he christened his spacecraft Beagle 2, managed to persuade people to put up the money for it. It was done on the cheap. And he hitched a lift with Mars Express. Everything went well. The spacecraft was taken to Mars and was released from orbit on Christmas Day 2003. Now, the plan was that Beagle 2, it had an aero shell, in other words, a screen to protect it as it flew through Mars's atmosphere and slowed down slowly enough to deploy a parachute. Mm. Um, Beagle 2 was deployed, it was sent on its way to Mars. An image was taken from Mars Express showing it receding into the distance. And sadly, that was then the last that was seen or heard of it. Because what everybody expected was that when it landed on Mars, it was going to announce its presence with by playing a track from the rock band Blur, which had been, I think, specially <laughs> recorded uh, for this. So everybody was listening out for this Blur track on Christmas Day 2003. It never came. And, of course, Colin Pillinger was very, very disappointed. He always maintained that his spacecraft made it to the surface, I think because he was so confident with the technology that had mm. been used. But most people thought that they'd got the atmospheric pressure wrong and the braking effect of the atmosphere was not enough for the spacecraft to slow down enough to deploy the parachute and that it had just basically hit the surface at very high speed and was basically littering the surface of Mars. So now fast forward a decade, actually more than a decade, because when the NASA Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter went into orbit, it actually was some years earlier, but people started using the high resolution camera on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter specifically to look for the wreckage, as everybody thought it would be, yeah. of Beagle 2. And in fact, what they did was they, they calculated the Beagle 2 landing zone and they had a pretty good estimate of where it would be. It was sort of something like 174 kilometres by 57 kilometres to start with, but I think they narrowed it down from that and then saw, you know, looked down using this high resolution camera trying to find some evidence of the wreckage of Beagle 2. So between, from 2006 when High Rise was first deployed the, the camera on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, between 2006 and 20 2014, they took 26 images of this area looking for signs of it. But then a citizen scientist in Germany, Michael Kroon, is actually a former member of the Mars Express operations team. Yeah. He noticed that there was a gap in the imaging and suggested that that should be a place where people should look. The images within Beagle's landing area were not complete. So he basically put in a request for another image to be taken to cover this. And that happened in November 20. 
2014, and he noticed that the lander, or something that looked like it, might be there, uh-huh. about 20 kilometers from the original landing target, fantastically close. And so they spotted it, and then people started analyzing the images and realized that actually Beagle 2 had landed successfully, and its four solar panels had failed to open properly. One of them hadn't opened, and the one that hadn't opened was covering the antenna. And so even though it probably did transmit the signal from Blur, the Blur rock band, Mm. uh, the fact that the antenna was covered up meant it never reached Earth. And that really was, I guess, a remarkable discovery to see that it did get there. It was successful, except that it didn't quite open its solar panels. There is new information as well, because there's there is an object that has been seen between different images from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. There's an object moving around, which they think is the, the rear cover of the spacecraft's aeroshell, which had a parachute attached to it, and it's probably blowing in the wind and moving around on the surface of Mars. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, quite extraordinary, quite yeah, remarkable stuff. You know, how typically astronomical is it for the only piece of ground that wasn't photographed to yes, be exactly right. where, where, mean, it, how, where it was? That's right. I mean, that's almost as weird as sending a space probe to Venus, landing, having it unfold, and then have a lens clap <laughs> lens and melt, to the, melt to the camera so you can't take photos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's happened. Uh, when you look at the list of um, tragic failures, I mean, they were almost yeah. not tragic failures that's the that's the irony in all of this and and this certainly was and there is one slightly well i suppose it's a poignant aspect to this as i said colin pillinger always believed that uh, his spacecraft made it to the surface sadly he died in 2014 a few months before this discovery was made so he never knew that he was absolutely right that beagle 2 made it onto the ground came within a whisker of being a successful mission that is sad but uh, i think he had enough self-belief to not have to be convinced Maybe that's that's correct, yes. <laughs> that's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Physicists at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, are joining forces to study the most massive elementary particle known, the top quark. The scientists are from the ATLAS and CMS experiments, which operate two of the four primary detectors around the 27-kilometer Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher located beneath the Franco-Swiss border. On the scale of elemental particles, the top quark is incredibly massive, almost as heavy as an atom of gold, but it's also far less understood than the other quarks. In all, there are six different types or flavours of quarks. The up, down, top, bottom, charm and strange. All quarks have half spin and either one-third or two-thirds electric charge. But each flavour has a different mass, with none coming even close to the mass of the top quark. Now, as we mentioned at the top of the program, quarks are mediated by the strong nuclear force through force particles called gluons to form subatomic particles like the protons and neutrons found in the nucleus of atoms. Understanding the top quark may help researchers find new physics beyond the standard model, which is the foundation stone of science's understanding of the universe. Unfortunately, the standard model can't tell us anything about either dark energy or dark matter, which combined make up some 95% of the total mass energy budget of the universe. Because of its enormous mass, the top quark is extremely short-lived, with a predicted lifetime of just 5 by 10 to the minus 25 seconds. Because of this, top quarks don't have the time to form hadrons before they decay. And that provides physicists with a unique opportunity to study the behaviour of a bare quark. The only known way the top quark can decay is through the weak nuclear force, producing a W boson and a down, strange or bottom quark. A decade ago, scientists with the American Tevatron Collider at Fermilab, which incidentally first discovered the top quark in 1995, found that when produced in pairs through proton-antiproton collisions, top quarks showed far more asymmetry than expected. In fact, the top quarks tended to be emitted in the direction of the proton beam, while the anti-top quarks would be aligned in the direction of the antiproton beam. Scientists think this could be tantalizing signs of new particles and forces, which are influencing top quark pair production. Of course, that backward-forward asymmetry seen at the Tevatron can't be replicated by the Large Hadron Collider because it smashes protons into protons, not into antiprotons. 
However, scientists can measure a related asymmetry in charge, causing top quarks to be preferentially produced at the centre of the colitis collisions. And if this effect turns out to be larger than expected, it could well be a sign of new physics. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Bigelow Aerospace and the United Launch Alliance have announced plans to place an inflatable habitat module into lunar orbit by 2020 using United's new Vulcan rocket. The B-330 inflatable habitat module will serve as a low lunar orbit staging post for planned missions to the Moon. The B-330 is a fully autonomous standalone space station design developed from the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module or BEAM. BEAM was flown to the International Space Station attached to a Dragon cargo ship in April 2016. It was docked to the aft port of the International Space Station's Tranquility Node and then inflated. Basically, the module is there to test its safety performance in low Earth orbit, including its life support systems, radiation shielding, thermal control and communication systems. Although not used on a regular basis, space station crew do enter the BEAM from time to time to see how it's holding up against the rigours of spaceflight. The beam will remain attached to the space station for at least three years. Inflatable modules are seen by many as the future of space habitation. That's because they take up far less room on a launch vehicle than conventional hard module structures, thereby lowering launch costs. The B-330, which was previously known as the Nautilus Space Complex Module and then the BA-330, evolved from NASA's original TransHab concept. The 20-ton module is 13.7 metres long, and has a diameter of 6.7 metres, making it about the size of two buses parked side by side. It contains some 330 cubic metres of internal space, hence its numeric designation. Once in position, the spacecraft will support zero-gravity research, including scientific missions and manufacturing processes. It also has potential as a destination for future space tourism habitats, and as a supply depot for long-duration deep space missions destined for the Moon or Mars. The B-330 will be flown to lunar orbit using United's new Vulcan launch vehicle. The Vulcan is designed to replace the United Launch Alliance's existing Atlas and Delta launch systems, with a new vehicle slated to fly by the end of 2019. Initially, Vulcan will use the same center upper stage currently used on the Atlas V. That is, until the new Advanced Cryogenic Evolved Stage or ACES upper stage is available sometime around 2024. United claim Vulcan will have just half the launch costs of the current Atlas V launch system. Once the B-330 is in low Earth orbit, Bigelow Aerospace will inflate, outfit and test the B-330 habitat before moving the module to lunar orbit using the new ACES upper stage for propulsion. The announcement comes in the wake of NASA's own plans for a deep space gateway space station, which will be placed in a Lagrange position between the Earth and Moon, providing a staging post for missions to the lunar surface. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has hit the newsstands. This month's magazine looks at the mysteries of neutron stars and how scientists are using X-rays to study these fascinating stellar corpses. The issue is also looking at the largest refractor telescope ever built and its sad final fate, and also a feature looking at how to spot fake space photos. Joining us now with all the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. G'day, Stuart. Yeah, our, our cover story in Australian Sky and Telescope is all about what astronomers call neutron stars, and we, we've called it death stars because they are sort of death stars. They're the dense, collapsed cores left behind when a very large star explodes towards the end of its life. They're sort of one step removed from being a black hole. When these massive stars explode, the inside of the star gets squashed in as well as the outside going flying off. And when the inside bit gets squashed in, if it goes so far it becomes a neutron star where it's just all made up of neutrons. If it goes a bit further it becomes a black hole. But neutron stars we're calling them death stars and they're somewhat hard to study. They are. They're, they're very small and of course they're a long way away. 
Well, they're already about the size of a city, aren't they? 25 k's or something across. Yeah, 20, 25 k's across. And, and that's something that's more or less the mass of our sun washed into something about 20, 25 kilometres across. So it, it, it's really, really dense material. Just, just Neutron solid generous. packed neutron star. Yeah, it, they're amazing things. But there's lots we still don't know about them. And they're a bit hard to study. One of the ways we can study them is through some of the uh, radiation they give off, and particularly in the form of X-rays. Okay, so X-rays come from these uh, neutron stars. To get one, it's sort of pointing at us, if you like, we get the X-rays. The problem with X-rays is, though, that they don't really make it down through the Earth's atmosphere, so you've got to study these things from up in orbit with satellites. So they've been doing that. They've been using X-ray telescopes up in space, and there's a new one about to launch soon. Actually, it's going to go up, and they're going to stick it on the outside of the space station. And it'll be a super-duper new X-ray telescope, and it'll be hunting for these neutron stars, and in particular ones they call pulsars, which are spinning neutron stars that emit radiation in sort of beams, and if you get those beams like pointed at you, it looks like a lighthouse flashing as it goes past, yes, every time it rotates around. So they should be able to make sort of X-ray movies of these pulsars uh, when they get this telescope up there, which would be pretty good. So that's the cover story. Also inside of Australian Sky and Telescope, we've got a story, a really fascinating historical story, about the largest refracting telescope ever built. Okay, okay. And before we go any further, what's the difference between a reflector and a refractor? Okay, reflector and refractor telescopes. When people think of a telescope, when an ordinary person in the street thinks of a telescope, they think of a long white tube. Army hard sky. Is, yeah. Things pirates <laughs> that's, use. And, yeah, and the ones pirates use, the sort of telescoping telescopes, that's called a refractor telescope because it has a lens or lenses at the front and the lens or lenses at the back and, and an enclosed tube. You can't get rain or water or anything inside it because the lens is at the front, lens at the back. It's the sort of uh, thing Galileo used, wasn't it? Yeah, Galileo. Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, a refractor uses lenses lenses to refract or bend the light as it's coming in and bring it to a focus point. The other ones, reflectors, they use mirrors. Uh, you still have lenses involved because you have eyepieces that you put in and they have lenses in them, but the thing that gathers the light is a big mirror rather than a lens, and that mirror it has a curve on it, a parabolic curve, and that brings the light to a focus point, and that's where you put your eyepiece and look through it. Are they so what Newtonian telescopes are? Newtonians are uh, uh, yeah, ref ref reflecting telescopes, and they're all sorts of different ones, and there are ones that are sort of half and half, you get schmidt cassegrain telescopes and other ones that are uh, got both lenses and mirrors and things. Uh, and there are all sorts of weird and wonderful others. But basically, they fall into two camps, refractors and reflectors. And this one we're talking about in the magazine was the largest refracting telescope ever built. So it had lenses. It had a lens that was 1.2 metres wide. Quite amazing. Now, this telescope worked for one year, and then it was sold as scrap. Oh. Uh, what this uh -huh. what's, what's this all about? Okay, we're talking about the Great Paris Telescope, which was built for the Paris Exhibition in the year 1900, and it was erected uh, not far from the Eiffel Tower. It was a huge instrument, 60 metres long, and unusually for a telescope, it was horizontal. It was, was flat against the ground rather than poking up into the sky. It actually had a mirror at one end, a two-metre-wide mirror at one end, which could be pointed in different directions, and it reflected whatever they were looking at, whether it was the moon or something else, into this big, long tube, and down the other end of the tube, the uh, observers or photographers set up their, um, them, themselves right at the other end. Now, although technically it did work, and it was the largest refractor ever built and, and still has that record, it wasn't very good. It certainly wasn't intended to be, and it wasn't useful for science. They didn't really do any scientific work with it. It was really just, uh, a, you know, what these marvellous exhibitions used to be like they had around the world. It was to demonstrate the amazing technology of the time and what they could do. So um, when the exhibition ended, Ended, the company that had built the telescope went bust and they put the telescope up for auction, but nobody wanted it. So eventually the metal parts were scrapped and the giant lenses were found many, many, many years later in packing crates in the bowels of the Paris Observatory. So there you are. It's a very sad tale of the, the biggest refracting telescope the world has ever seen. Lots more detail in the article in the magazine. And I don't think we'll ever see a telescope of that kind that big ever again because um, they're, they're too hard to build, too expensive to build, and it's much, much easier and cheaper to use the mirror systems these days and they can build ginormous mirror telescopes. And also there are problems with the very fact that they're refracting light in the first place. The way the different wavelengths of light collect means the picture's going to be blurred. Yeah, you can get all sorts of different effects with, um, with lenses in telescopes, but what they do, with certainly with the telescopes you buy for use in the backyard, is you can use combinations of lenses that one lens might have a, uh, a particular side effect while the other lens will, will cancel that out. And they have all sorts of coatings and all sorts of special things they can put on. Some lens systems have 10 what they call elements so 10 lenses all joined together, all giving a certain kind of characteristic that you want to give you a perfect view out the other end. And in fact, this is, this is interesting, the, the refractor telescopes give you superb views, more so 
generally speaking, than reflector telescopes. They really do give you lovely, lovely views, and they've always been preferred by people who like to look at the planets, amateur astronomers who particularly like to look at planets rather than other things that are like, like galaxies or nebulae far away. But the problem is that refractor telescopes are expensive compared to reflectors. Reflectors are cheap. A mirror is just a piece of glass with some aluminium coating on it, and it's pretty cheap. You stick it in a tube, a few other bits and pieces, and you've got yourself a telescope. The grinding of the lenses and the putting them all together and the, and the special sort of glass you have to use because the light is going through the glass rather than just being reflected off a, a surface layer in a reflecting telescope. This makes refractors expensive. So for a particular aperture, that is a width of the telescope, you can get a much bigger bang for your buck with a reflecting telescope than you can with a refractor. But refracting telescopes tend to be super duper quality and there are some amazing companies around the world that make super duper quality refracting telescopes for amateur astronomers. It's a lot of people's ambition to save up enough money one day to buy one of these things. Of course, you can get cheaper ones too, but generally speaking, the rule of thumb is for a particular size of telescope, you get a bigger bang, or a particular budget, I should say, you get a much bigger bang for your buck out of reflecting telescopes than refracting telescopes. Now, another really interesting article we've got in the magazine this month, Stuart, is all about something that really isn't just confined to astronomy, and that is how to spot when a photo is real or it's fake. Wow. Yeah, well, as we know, seeing isn't always believing in mm. the digital age, is it? No, and it's really easy to make up a photo that looks like it's a real image of space, but it's in fact put together from two different photos or whatever. Or some people grab someone else's photo, make a few changes, and then put it out and say, hey, what a great photo I've taken, you know? Well, you can't rely on getting away with this forever because there are people out there looking for fakes and they can spot fakes, you know? Uh, and fakes have been spotted and culprits exposed. There's a famous photo that someone put out was a sort of a series of photos of the International Space Station going in front of the moon, and it looked really good, but some people looked at it and thought, hang on, this doesn't add up. And it didn't add up. In fact, the, uh, the size of the space station in front of the moon was too big. It couldn't possibly have looked like that. So when they dug into it a bit further, they realized that this person had just faked it. And there are other ones where, as I say, people will grab someone else's photo, make a few little changes and put it out and say it's their own. I really don't know why you do that. Um, because you want everyone to think you've got a real girlfriend. That's why. Come on, get with it. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of thing, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. All the fake pictures people put in their LinkedIn page or, uh, or Facebook or something. But, you know, I, I, I know an astronomer who um, used to sell prints, beautiful color prints of photographs that he'd taken of space. And he had a big problem of people basically plagiarizing his work. His first name wasn't David, was it? Might have been. Yes, uh, but okay. I, but, yeah. yes. And he would he had a really cunning, he had a cunning plan. What he would do is, because all these pictures would have thousands of little star, mm. stars on them, some big, some small, and he would paint out one of the little stars on the different photos he would send out. So if he saw it ever again, he would know that it was his. Quite clever. But of course, in the digital age, people can do all sorts of things. Anyway, it's a really interesting story about how people have spotted fake astro photos and how you can spot one as well. There's plenty more in the Australian Sky and Telescope, including instructions for how to spot Pluto in the night sky at the moment. Hint, you'll need a pretty big backyard telescope, but if you've got one, you can do it. There's also information about the meteor showers and the planets that are up and around at the moment. We also have the winning photos from one of the Australian Australia's biggest annual astrophotography competitions. We have a test report of a super telescope mount that you can buy, and we also show you how to make a really functioning observing stool that you can sit on while you're at your telescope, but that also fits all your telescope bits inside. And there's lots, lots more there as well. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study claims that up to 16 weeks of intermittent fasting without otherwise having to count calories helps fight obesity and other metabolic disorders. The findings reported in the journal Cell Research supports existing studies showing that such fasting already provides benefits after only six weeks. The new work found that intermittent fasting helped to kickstart the metabolism and to burn fat by generating body heat. Unhealthy eating habits and sedentary lifestyles are playing a major role in the development of lifestyle-related metabolic diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease and obesity. So, dietary interventions like intermittent fasting are gaining popularity to treat conditions like obesity. The scientists wanted to better understand the reactions that interventions such as fasting trigger on a molecular level in the body. Researchers exposed groups to 16 weeks of intermittent fasting, which involved two days of regular healthy eating, followed by one day of not eating at all. 
And four months later, the fasting group weighed less than those in the control group who continued eating normally. Interestingly, lower body weight in the fasting groups wasn't the only effect. The fasting regime also helped lower fat build up in the white fat by increasing the brown-like fat involved in burning energy and producing body heat. And their glucose and insulin systems also remain more stable. A new study warns that the North Atlantic right whale could be just 20 years away from extinction. The findings were presented to the North Atlantic right whale consortium's annual meeting in Halifax. The conference was told current research suggests there are just 451 northern right whales left alive. In the past year, 15 have died, primarily because of human activity such as ship collisions, entanglement in fishing nets, habitat pollution and degradation, noise from ships and navy sonar activities, and because of ecosystem climate change. Scientists estimate the species now has a little over two decades left to survive unless drastic changes are made immediately. Researchers have found that men who smoke and who have at least five oral sex partners are at the highest risk of head and neck cancers caused by the human papillomavirus, HPV. The findings reported in the Annals of Oncology looked at data from 13,089 people aged 20 to 69, finding that only 0.7% of men will ever develop HPV-related head and neck cancers. HPV is best known for its link with cervical cancer, but the researchers warn cases of oral cancer will surpass cervical cancer in the US by 2020. They say the big problem is that because the disease is still so rare, screening presents a challenge. A new study claims there's been a sharp rise in self-harm reported in general practices for girls aged 13 to 16, compared with boys of the same age. The findings, reported in the British Medical Journal, also determined that self-harm rates were far higher in socially deprived areas. Self-harm in children and adolescents is a major public health problem in many countries. It's also the strongest risk factor for subsequent suicide, with suicide being the second most common cause of deaths worldwide before the age of 25. Unlike most previous studies, the researchers examined self-harm recorded in general practice rather than in hospital settings. To estimate the rates of self-harm, they analysed data from 16,912 patients aged between 10 and 19 years from 647 general practices who harmed themselves between 2001 and 2014. They found that the rates of self-harm recorded in general practice was higher in girls at 37.4 per 10,000 compared with boys at 12.3 per 10,000 and rose by 68% in girls aged 13 to 16 from 45.9 per 10,000 in 2011 to 77 per 10,000 in 2014. Children and teenagers who self-harmed were nine times more likely to die unnaturally compared to unaffected children, with an especially marked increase in suicide and acute drug or alcohol poisoning deaths. The researchers say the high self-harm rates may be due to common mental health problems in females at this age, as well as biological factors such as puberty and the onset of sexual activity. A new study claims Australia is one of just seven countries responsible for 60% of the world's biodiversity loss between 1996 and 2008. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, are based on a study of the conservation status of species in 109 countries and compared that to conservation funding. They found that conservation funding reduced biodiversity loss by around a third per country on average and that how far those dollars go depends on environmental pressure from human development. The authors say their study could help policymakers figure out just how much funding is needed in order to achieve a specific biodiversity goal. And finally for now, a new study claims something we've all suspected. Dogs may well be using facial expressions to communicate with their humans. The findings published in scientific reports may well explain why you often feel like your dog's trying to tell you something. The research suggests that dogs attempt to communicate by making facial expressions. During the study, scientists found the dogs didn't produce facial expressions when presented with exciting things like food, but they did make expressions when receiving attention from humans. Scientists say the findings suggest that facial expressions aren't simply an uncontrolled response, because the dogs also responded more when humans were paying attention. This is Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or your favourite podcast download provider. 
Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in flight entertainment. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lower case, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 